<laughs> and we are live. Yeah. Welcome, no one. <laughs> Let's give it another second. And uh, yeah, so at this time, there are quite some parallel sessions that Horasi is happening. Uh, it is lunchtime, so we'll give people a minute to pop into the rooms. Okay. We're just going to start because the session is being recorded as well. Uh, so there we go. Um, welcome to this panel of the Horasis Young Visionaries at the uh, Horasis Global Meeting. My name is Jonta Brakman, and I'm the founder and CEO of Impact Shakers, where we help to build and scale inclusive impact businesses. Today, we want to dive into the subject of social mobility and closing of the wealth gap through entrepreneurship and investment. Entrepreneurship and investment are traditionally wealth drivers, both of which are systemically not equally accessible to everyone, though. Now, how can we offer the opportunity to start building up wealth and increase social mobility to a new generation of entrepreneurs and investors? All of us in this panel chose entrepreneurship as our vehicle for change. We all support impact entrepreneurs and investors, either with development, community, resources, or financing. The research on this subject is still very limited, which is why I'm so happy that we're having this discussion today on this platform. And please, anyone interested in following up on this discussion, reach out to me later. Now let's introduce the panelists who each approach this subject from a slightly different perspective. We have Temi, who works with uh, vulnerable youth at Equity Lab. Marie works with newcomers, refugees, migrants at Finclusive. Then we have Priya, who approaches it from a sector perspective in 200 million artisans. And she kind of builds the bridge to the investors. And that is Mabinti from Legacy Venture Impact Enterprises Africa, um, who is an impact investor. And Savan, who approaches it from the impact investment sector perspective with Solifi. So let's start with introductions here. Um, Mabinti, will you start? Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Lancha, and being with fellow panelists. My name is Mabinti Karoma Moore, and I have Live Africa Legacy Impact Venture Enterprises. We provide impact measurement and management support for investors, entrepreneurs, entrepreneur support organizations. And we do it using a gender lens, understanding how investments and resources are impacting women and historically marginalized communities across emerging and frontier markets. What excites us about the work that we do is that we're trying to address the, the capital gaps. Uh, a part of our business also includes a fund that is called Kuishi, which is the Swahili word to live. We want to ensure that African women-led businesses have the resources not only to have sustainable companies, but also to help their communities. It's about being and creating this legacy of impact um, that can be passed on down through entrepreneurship. We operate in Nairobi and in New York, and we're really excited to be here and working with partners and organizations so that we can realize meaningful material impact down the line. Thank you very much. Tammy, uh, would you like to go next? Sure. Thanks so much, Yoncha, for inviting to this panel. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight, just sharing and exchanging ideas around how do we use entrepreneurship as a vehicle to address social mobility issues, which is a global issue that we are tackling at this moment. Uh, my name is Temi. Um, I am born and brought up in Mongolia, but I'm currently based in Singapore. Um, I am a founder and CEO of Equity Lab, uh, which is a social enterprise working with underprivileged youth to help them gain um, income translatable skills 
to be able to improve their livelihoods as early as they can and also try to bridge opportunities, to, uh, growth opportunities to them through non-monetary incentives and sort of channels and uh, um, incentives, etc. So um, here I am tonight, very excited to uh, share and exchange and learn from you guys. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Uh, Marie? Yeah, uh, well, thanks a lot uh, for uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate with all all you amazing uh, entrepreneurs yourselves. I think that the, the, the subject of uh, social mobility and the wealth gap has been a very, very central to me on many years. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm very happy to, to be a part of this. So I, I myself have always been working with microfinance and entrepreneurship support at various levels because my experience stems from sector support in Morocco uh, to very hands-on support uh, to your young entrepreneurs in uh, Canada, as well as a more sectoral approach at the European level. Uh, and it was clear in all those settings that underprivileged populations, such as immigrants and youth, very often turn to entrepreneurship to uh, improve their livelihoods. And with the service economy booming, uh, it is these vulnerable uh, populations that have been dependent on, that we have been dependent on, uh, and COVID-19 has put that even more uh, into the light. So when I arrived in Denmark in 2017, I naturally started looking at what was in place to, to support entrepreneurship for low-income individuals and found that all, although the support is very well established when it comes to innovative businesses uh, and university bread ventures, uh, there's very little support for all the others uh, and especially uh, historically uh, marginalized communities. And uh, very, very quickly, I learned that on top of access to funds, uh, the financial exclusion these entrepreneurs face first and foremost is access to banking, a simple business account to receive payments and pay bills in a normal way. And this is because banks are under a lot of pressures uh, to track money laundering activities and it creates a negative incentive to have a clientele of very small businesses whose main support is to sustain their owners. So uh, I created Finclusive in 2019 and I developed a partnership with a cooperative bank uh, and together we set up a program to support access to banking uh, to business owners and entrepreneurs who have received asylum in Denmark. Uh, we have been quite successful so far, uh, as 75% of our recommendations have been approved um, and the business owners we have supported uh, declared expecting a, a, a turnover of over 3 million uh, over the next year. Um, and if you consider that 42% of them were receiving social support the year before they launched their activity, uh, you really see you know, how, how, how this increases uh, their wealth. Uh, and hopefully, you know, decreases the wealth gap over time. And, and this problem affects youth particularly, as almost 50% of our clients are under 50, or under 30, sorry. <laughs> so we are doing this by providing coaching and training to our candidates so that they understand the requirements uh, local banks have and the best way for them to develop a positive relationship with their bank. Uh, and now we are setting up our first loan product that will be guaranteed by a partner fund. But our vision is to extend to all of Europe and position us ourselves as the platform that will link refugee business owners to banks in order to set them up in the best possible way for their small ventures while making them a lot, risk, lot less risky for the banks. Um, so, so, yeah, that, that's, that's what we want to do and uh, what we've been doing so far. Thank you, Marie. Uh, Savan, what do you do with Solifin? <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you, uh, first of all, uh, Yoncha, for the invitation um, and, and very pleased to be part of this uh, uh, very beautiful and diverse panel today. So um, uh, my name is Sevan Holemans. I'm, I'm based in Brussels. Uh, I'm a social, social entrepreneur myself uh, and now managing director of, uh, of Solifin, which is a, a network of um, 22 now uh, financial actors uh, sharing the same values um, and doing what we call now impact finance. Um, and, and the first, first uh, let's say, value that they share all together is transparency. Um, but before starting to explain you, Solifin, uh, it's, it's important for me just to, to mention that uh, myself, uh, I started to be an entrepreneur and, and, uh, from, and I really started the company from scratch, starting with microcredits, going through uh, crowdfunding, 
uh, and and really the entire let's say uh, trajectory um, for someone starting with an educational background but with no money at all at the beginning. I I had um, then very hard uh, let's say um, uh, adventures as well. I lost a lot of money throughout the way, and now money is really part of uh, it's at the center of my of my life and of what I'm doing with Solifin. And with Solifin, we're doing the intermediary between entrepreneurs and uh, the financial world. Um, and there's a lots of pitfalls and lots of mistakes I've committed myself, but many entrepreneurs have committed and, and are still committing because most of the time, lack of education and lack of knowledge um, that we are trying now with Solifin to avoid um, uh, and, and to help them then secure them their funding without uh, going to, to the same pitfalls that we have ex experienced. So um, this is about it about Solifin. So, and just a, a, a small figure that I wanted to share as well. Um, so we are helping about 100 uh, companies every year. And uh, the gender balance, it's not yet balanced, but we had 35% of entrepreneurs, actually, uh, last year, women entrepreneurs, um, which is much higher than, than many uh, statistics I often hear uh, when we talk about entrepreneurship. So this is just a, a stat to, to launch the debate for afterwards as well. Um, but yeah, I'll stop here. Yeah, quick, quick uh, on the numbers. We just had uh, our Impact Shakers Awards, and one of the things I've been thinking and feeling, but I want to see backed up by numbers, is that people that start impact businesses are more diverse than the general numbers for startups, let's say. And uh, from our numbers, 80% of the people that submitted applications um, came from a diverse background. So <laughs> significantly higher, I would say. Um, Priya, please, what are you doing with 200 million artisans? <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Yoncha. And I'm just so thrilled to be part of this amazing group of women. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear stories of what people are um, what they're doing on ground to drive change. Um, I am clearly the baby of the group uh, because I'm um, an accidental entrepreneur at, for one. Um, and two, um, I'm a researcher at heart, to be honest, and I'm uh, a champion of all things creative. Uh, so I've worked in the creative industries all my life as a journalist, as a storyteller, uh, in the arts and crafts space. And I think one of the burning questions I have come across in my life across time um, is that why do creativity led enterprises not find the kind of support uh, when they set out to uh, grow themselves? You don't find ecosystem builders, you don't find innovation actors, you know, uh, stepping in to support them, mentor them and help them grow. Um, and honestly, it's that burning question where I felt that, you know, how do we bring creativity in conversation with sustainable development? And how do we value creativity, everyday creative activities in our life uh, and bring it, uh, become, make it help it become a lot more mainstream that got me here, to be honest. And I was in Boston when um, I was asking these tough questions only to realize that the wealth gap and when we talk about social mobility, uh, a lot of the social mobility does not exist in small villages and grassroots. It is the creative businesses. It is your hairdresser. It is your little tailor, you know, who's setting up businesses uh, that is creating who are creating value and these are creative businesses but we don't value them because we think they cannot scale and this whole obsession with scale uh, is really what got me to uh, really dig deep, deeper and 200 million artisans um, really started out as a COVID response initiative back uh, it's been a year when all these creativity led enterprises back in India who work with artisan communities reached out in the midst of COVID because they did not have a plan B. They did not have working capital. They did not know how to respond to COVID, pay their artisans, so on and so forth. And that's when I realized that the systemic uh, bias against these kind of businesses is so deep and deep rooted that we need to find ways to support these enterprises because they're honestly, you know, they people set up businesses not because they're looking for an exit strategy. They set up businesses because they genuinely believe in the product that they're building uh, and they want to make a change. And there is nobody to handhold these businesses to help them become self-sustainable or even, you know, grow in whatever uh, in whatever way possible. So long short of it, uh, long and short of it, um, 200 million artisans started out as a COVID response initiative, but six months back, we sort of pivoted to really um, 
address the challenges faced by creative and social entrepreneurs who work with artisan communities in India. Because we realized when we started getting into the whole conversation that sectorally, there is no sector uh, called the handmade sector. And I think what people forget is that there are 200 million undocumented people who work with artisans in India. That's a huge number. And that's just in India. Uh, let's not even go into Africa and Latin America. Um, and we decided that we will support impact enterprises because invariably any enterprise that chooses to work with artisan communities becomes an impact enterprise. Most of them tend to be women led. It's over 50 percent participation of women in this sector. Um, so we said that we will accelerate, help accelerate growth for impact enterprises in India's artisan sector by bridging the no, uh, gaps in knowledge, resources, and partnerships. Because when we started talking to investors, they were like, oh, but you know, we don't know what, how big the sector is. Can you get us proof points? And then we start, when we started talking to enterprises, we realized even if we bring in the money, they were not ready to accept the money. So there were so many systemic gaps that, you know, that are a sectoral problem. Um, and that's a policy bias, investment bias over time. And we realized that we need to support these enterprises and help them become, one, self-sustainable, and two, help them scale and grow, but scale sustainably, because that, I think, is important in the times that we live in. Um, and also create value for, uh, you know, sustainable production and consumption. I think, you know, sitting in Europe, I, I think you would agree that world over as consumers, we are changing and we want something different. And India can and these enterprises can really uh, bridge that next level production and consumption gap that consumers such as ourselves, uh, people such as ourselves are looking for. But we need to support them to scale and to serve the needs of the consumer of the future. Um, and that's really what we're doing. So uh, that's 200 million artisans for you. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Um, you already touched a bit upon um, how entrepreneurship can help increase social mobility. Um, but let's start with young people. Tell me, um, the setup of, of Equity Lab is to create social mobility in youth, right? Yeah, really, I really resonate with the problems that, you know, all of you panelists, amazing people are addressing and also talking about, right? And when we started off the journey of Equity Lab earlier in 2020, um, last year, we started to understand the system, uh, the problem of systemic poverty. Millions of people today are trapped in systemic poverty, and uh, it's due to many, many factors. And, of course, you can't do everything and all, but then we try to come up with a way that we can sort of contribute from grassroots level. And that's how we kind of conceptualize the solution the Equity Lab is running these days for underprivileged uh, youth, which is basically, we know that for underprivileged youth, it's hard for them to be even seen as a person, as a community, as a people, as a potential, who has a potential to do something great in the future. How do, then, with them receiving not very good quality of education and not being able to have that competitive edge over other kids in sort of well-off communities and all, we wanted to give them that sort of leap of sort of uh, uh, leap of change and growth by way of sort of empowering them to first be able to co uh, contribute in their communities, betterment of their environment in their community, doing as, as little contribution as, you know, cleaning up the streets, cleaning up the river, helping better the, maybe uh, helping better the environment by contributing uh, in ways that they can, only in their own capacity. Let's start from there. Show us, tell us your story of how you are creating this small little change of spark in your own little community, own little environment. Tell us about those stories. We'll help you to come up, you know, come be visible in the broader community with your stories and with your contributions so that one day you will be recognized by your sort of, you know, um, commitments and the hard work that you're doing. It doesn't have to be, you know, those standardized test scores, right? It, let's think of it in better ways that actually mean something, right? Meaningful ways. And then that's how we sort of um, are helping underprivileged youth in Mongolia and Singapore to also be seen by their sort of passion and contributions, commitments, actions, rather than application forms to the, you know, colleges, to the prospective employers in the future. And then through that process, we're also providing trainings 
and all types of mentorships and coaching to help them to also have this, you know, uh, carry on this growth mindset and also the positive life attitude that someday I'll be there standing with you. Uh, you know, all those hopes, we just keep on sparking in them throughout this entire process of us working with each and every individual for about six months to one year time. And so far, we've been getting really good sort of feedback and also impact in those kids from their parents, from their teachers and everything. So it kind of creates this ripple effect. So more and more underprivileged youth are now coming, reaching out to Equity Lab saying, can I participate in your program? <laughs> and now we're at a point of time to even think about how do we then scale the program? How do we ensure that this program reaches every, you know, every kid on the block who has this heart and the you know passion to grow out of their existing circumstances and livelihoods which they you know to change the livelihoods of the family for the parents for themselves for the fu future kids and everything so these are some of the beautiful stories they share with us when they come on board with us at the equity lab thank you tammy um Marie, when, when you think about social mobility um, and the people you are working with, is that high on their agenda? Um, or is, um, as you said, the access to banking is priority number one? And does that lead to more? Um, can you shed some perspective on this? You're mute. You hear me now. <laughs> It does. Uh, very, very often uh, we are approached by uh, a person that um, has struggled and uh, decided to, to, to go the entrepreneurial way, create their own little business. Um, and then they start very often and they start. And after they start it, they go and see their bank. And, uh, and they're very surprised by the fact that the bank doesn't want to open a, a business account. Um, very often they don't understand it and the banks don't really give a reason for it. Why? Because uh, the, ba the banks are um, estimating that those small businesses and especially with uh, people that we're working with that are um, with very short um, residency um, in, in Denmark. So it's two years residencies max for refugees in Denmark. So, so the, the fact that the residency is so short and that they're linked to uh, countries that have a high risk of, of terror financing, just, you know, goes in the, the risk ratings of the bank go, go extremely high, extremely quickly. And of course, they're not going to tell that to people looking at them in the eye, right? Uh, so, so there's a lot of frustration there. Uh, I cannot have a business account. It's a simple thing. I was not expecting this problem, uh, and I don't understand why. Uh, and and the, we were talking about uh, hairdressers, um, just like you were saying, um, a lot of drivers, subcontracted drivers, um, people having small businesses, you know, very often. So we help them getting access to a corporate account. Uh, we also train them and, uh, and coach them in order for the bank to have a good, um, a good track record of clients coming through us. The reputation of the clients that we recommend uh, is very much, you know, our, our flagship, right? Uh, and it will make the next entrepreneurs in line uh, much more um, much more likely to open business accounts and so very often they 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 create a job for themselves and very often their objective is to create jobs for others um, so there is very often a, a will to to grow um, starting with you know starting with themselves of course and we see we see that as a trickle down effect as well uh, we see that you know if they if they increase their livelihoods and they start employing others. They will very often employ people that they trust, they're comfortable with, people from their own community. Um, and these people will then also um, be able to increase their livelihoods. And very often these people have strong ties with very vulnerable people that are left in the home countries, right? It's only the very successful refugee that become refugees, all the others stay either uh, in their home country uh, in, in horrible conditions that they live in uh, or in, uh, in, um, in refugee camps um, around the world. So, so they will also be sending money home uh, to help. So, so I think the trickle down effect is extremely important in our case. Um, you help one person create um, better conditions for themselves and their families, it will impact the whole community. 
I, I have such a negative connotation to trickle down effect by the US using it to increase, like, to lower taxes for the wealthy. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but I wrote it down. We can use it in different, um, in different contexts. <laughs> and this is a very good trickle down effect, um, which is also what you're working on, right, Priya? from a sector perspective, not um, a, a specific challenge they overcame in life, like a refugee. Um, but how do you do that for a sector? So uh, for us, I think what has been a, a challenge, so I think you'll need to understand a bit of the historical context. Uh, so before we are a colonized nation, so India has been a colonized nation, and we need to now acknowledge the fact that we were colonized and a lot of impact that seeing uh, and which is also rooted in then our own understanding of our own identity is rooted then in this colonization. And I think in forums like this, we need to address that, first of all. So and I'll give you a very simple example. Before we were colonized, um, India was producing or contributing to about 25 percent of the world's GDP along with China. So that was be between India and China, we contributed to 50% of the world's GDP. And 300 years later, our share of the world's GDP went down to 4%. So you can imagine, you know, the transition that happened to a nation that was used to doing things a certain way. And a huge subsection of this kind of export driven uh, production that India was known for was one agriculture and two handmade products you know, creative manufacturing or whatever it is that we choose to call it today. But that was textiles and these kind of products were one of the biggest exports going out of India. What happens after that? And when we talk about social mobility and when we talk about these kind of issues, we need to first address that these communities were therefore over a period of time marginalized and their sustainable ways like the artisan economy in India has been always sustainable because it always works. It's a seasonal product. It works in sync with na in natural resources. Uh, it's a slow production process. It, you only create what is needed as opposed to the kind of fast fashion approaches that we are taking. So that's also a kind of mindset towards production. Now, having said that, because we don't value it, obviously, and we never bother to value it. This and it, because it operates as an informal economy, like it does in many emerging economies, uh, this informality has never been documented. It was never, you know, there was no data uh, collected around it. There were no, there was no documentation done around uh, sustainable processes that were already embedded within the Indian uh, artisanal ecosystem. And therefore, after 65 years of independence, of India being independent, uh, for the first time in the census, the artisan sector was even counted as a category, which means it was documented for the first time in India in back in 2012. So you can imagine there is a massive number discrepancy because officially there are about 11 million artisans and unofficially there are about 200 million artisans across the country. So and that is why we call ourselves 200 million artisans, because it's a policy issue. This is not their fault. Their being informal is not the artisans fault. It's uh, the investors fault. It's the policy's fault because you haven't been you don't think it's cool enough to map this sector and to understand its unique challenges and needs. And therefore, it's a sectoral problem and not just a, oh, this poor little cute old lady making beads. No, it's not that. We're talking about millions of dollars of sustainable production that can position India um, as the, you know, the next potential exporter to, you know, the kind of demands that are coming out of Europe and other parts of the world. But we're not looking into this seriously. And recent numbers have suggested that while India might be, you know, great with its IT services and so on and so forth, we have a 12 percent, 140 billion dollar missing production in low skill labor. And basically this sector can contribute to this low skilled or differently skilled labor while creating jobs, while creating sustainable production and creating inclusion because it has 50 percent participation of women. No other sector can claim to have over 50 percent participation of women because what happens with the kind of enterprises we are talking about 
is that these enterprises do not expect you to set up a factory. They don't set up factories. They actually take entrepreneurship to the doorstep of the woman who cannot move out of her house uh, in most cases because of patriarchal situations. So, and this uh, is not unique to India. This will happen in Africa. This will also happen in Latin America and most parts of the world. So we, the enterprises are actually innovating around the informality that exists within this kind of landscape. And and these are the kind of business models that we should be studying. But, you know, they're not cool enough for most impact investors, because if you're an impact enterprise, if you're an enterprise trying to solve an issue at the grassroots, you don't set up an enterprise because you want an exit strategy. You know, you set up an enterprise because you really want to serve the communities and you're not looking for a quick exit. You're not looking for quick you know, scale. And I think most impact enterprises or investors don't seem to understand that if you're talking about co-creation, collaboration and these kind of issues, it's also the onus is also up to them to meet these enterprises halfway and listen to the needs of these enterprises as opposed to telling them what they should be doing and create these impossible definitions of scale, which is why this sector gets left behind. So which is why we are looking, taking a sectoral approach towards this and really saying that we need to reshift and change the definition of one scale. We need to look at ideas like the new formal, where the formal, formal and the informal meet, where social protections are embedded and so on and so forth. The banking access is created for women and marginalized communities. And these are the kind of enterprises who do it. And we need to really start looking at these business models and start supporting them. Thank you, Priya. Some huge opportunity for social mobility there. Yeah. By looking from, yeah. Um, let's, let's look at it from the perspective of an investor, Mobinti. Um, Social mobility of entrepreneurs, is that high on your list? Oh, it's, a, it's a priority on our list. It's our guiding principle. I, I, I resonated so deeply with Priya and Marie and Tammy and Savan on some of the points raised. I think uh, Priya calling out colonialism and its impact in the way investors deploy capital. I think the biggest challenge that we have and we're still navigating is the lack of diversity and inclusion on investment teams. Um, and that creates and, and emboldens more unconscious bias and who is investable and who isn't. Uh, when we look at women, you look at how much uh, women entrepreneurs are creating, the households that are dependent on them, unpaid work. Um, even in, in my work with investors, it's really um, creating greater visibility of is this financial instrument actually aligned with the needs of the potential investees that you want to reach? And then when sometimes there is this bias where um, certain industries or certain sectors are, seen, are deemed too risky to even deploy capital. Um, I think we still are stuck in this um, way of investing in tech because it's deemed still the sexier uh, sector. Uh, it's deemed to be more scalable, um, to be um, you're able to exit fairly quickly. Um, but I think you're missing out on opportunities. We're leaving opportunities on the table um, by not diversifying investment teams, um, by not really understanding and working with investing companies. Um, I also resonated with the need to invest in the arts. So, for example, our work with an, a certain investor uh, they're based in Kenya. They invest in um, art, uh, artisans. Uh, they're called the Hiva Fund. Um, and our role was working with them to understand what the needs are of micro um, SMEs. These women have uh, these uh, companies based in low resource areas of Nairobi. Uh, they're supporting their families. We found that over 60% of the women in this market um, were generating some revenue to support their families and their communities. A majority of them were women who had children and were supporting a family. And so when we had these series of conversations, we understood what their experiences are. What they wanted was marketing. What they needed was access to networks. What they needed was access to banking. Um, their limited access to banking caused them to form, some women uh, relied on getting sources of capital from Chamas. And that's uh, C-H-A-M-A-S, which is, are informal groups where women pool together capital to lend to other women. 
So this is not unique. This is something that's been done across the West Indies, across the African continent, where people are pulling capitals. In Senegal, there's um, a, an investment group called the Women Investment Club where they pull again capital and they lend to other women. They provide terms that align with these women. And as an investor and as a company, we look at how can we support women and meet them where they are. Um, and now that you have more impact investors wanting to um, look at more potential opportunities, we help them navigate the impact reporting requirements because sometimes the impact reporting uh, requirements are so extensive that some entrepreneurs don't even want to take the capital. So how do we identify what are the metrics that matter most? What is uh, what will provide information that is valuable on the financial and social and environmental impact for investors to drive more capital, um, to drive capital through the form of technical assistance? And for us, we look at health, education, the arts, technology, and health sectors. Uh, and, and it was important for us to look at the arts and creative economy because it's it's underinvested in, um, particularly when you look across Africa and notice that it's majority women. And then even when when entrepreneurs want to succeed capital, they don't go to the investors sometimes because I don't want any debt or there is this fear or lack of um, awareness about equity investments. When you go to a woman and sometimes and say, you know, I want to make an equity investment, they're like, you're, you're taking away my company. So it's, it's about educating um, um, entrepreneurs. It's about educating investors. It's really aligning incentives. It's really redefining what it means to be uh, a risk or take risk. And you can't just deem an opportunity risky because it's not someone you typically invest in. It's about diversifying our investment teams to broaden where we source deals and not going to the typical alumni networks or the typical organizations. Um, we need to, to really diversify these teams and also the investment instruments that we use to invest in. Because sometimes there's certain instruments that people deem sexier than others. Let's do a new impact bond or this, let's do this new bridge financing facility. Um, but have you tested it in the market? Is it really aligned with what the market needs? Um, and sometimes how can we unlock more capital from other investors? How can we use philanthropic capital better? Like during the pandemic, what I think many of us saw is, are the, this emergence of rapid response mechanisms, these COVID relief funds. And it's only a short period of time, not giving a lot of entrepreneurs enough runway to use capital in a way to support their businesses. And for us, it's really understanding the needs of our potential investees and making sure they have enough runway, working with them as partners, redefining that investor-investee relationship as not just a top-down dynamic, but working together to ensure that they are able to grow their business, they're able to um, have financial inclusion, to hire more people from historically marginalized communities. And so I think it's redefining what is investable. Um, and we have to take in consideration ethnicity, gender, differently able people, um, and, and because we're missing out on deals and we're missing out on opportunities to really advance positive impact that's material. So that's, as an investor's point of view, we are a different type. Um, and we believe that we have to disrupt in order to move forward. Disrupt away, Mabinti. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, uh, it's exactly what I, what I think about how to diversify the investors, um, how that will make a huge change. And not only um, in, in, um, who they are, gender, ethnicity, where they invest, but also um, in uh, the the communities they invest in. Um, the like you were saying, um, and the types of profiles that become investors, because very often it is bankers, investment bankers, people with a corporate background. Um, people that have a very traditional relationship with uh, money. Um, and if we want to disrupt the way the financial system works and an investment system works, we need different types of profile to enter. It's We need different types of entrepreneurs as well. Eh? We need the anthropologists to join and the sociologists and 
Let's go to Savan's work where he's uniting the different types of capital um, in one particular ecosystem. Um, Savan, how do you see the relationship of Solifin um, with social mobility and this closing of the wealth gap or the potential to? Yeah, so I, I can only echo a lot what, I, what has been said, even though um, I, I also realize that my perspective will be a, a little bit different because I'm speaking from a Belgian pers perspective um, where lots of things already exist for uh, social mobility and to help actually entrepreneurship uh, and the starting of those companies. And if we look at, uh, I mean, it, it's really wealthy here. Uh, so speaking from Belgium, I can only see lots of microcredit institutions, lots of public subsidies, grants, programs going to the schools and, and pushing for entrepreneurship very early, early on uh, for really young, young people. And, and so I see lots of barriers already were over, overcome by uh, the states being uh, very inter interventionist here and coming from, from a country where there is a lot of money and, and we should be uh, all aware um, so of this. So um, uh, from the Solifin's perspective, how we see social mobility is actually once this entrepreneurship started is to, to help them um, actually giving them the same chances as someone who has been, let's say, more educated into entrepreneurship and, and, and money and, and financial background to, to kind of give them there the same chances. And what, I, what I'm speaking of is that, for instance, lots of entrepreneurs are coming to us and they don't have much background about uh, their financials. They don't know much about money. Um, they don't know much about how to manage money. They don't know much about what's a, an ideal mix of, uh, of uh, investment, for instance, and, and financing mix. Uh, and more than that, uh, and that's the second step, is that there, there is a huge um, asymmetry of information between entrepreneurs and the financial sector. The financial sector is they know very well uh, who they're talking to. They know very well the sectors they're active in. But most of the time, the entrepreneurs, they don't know much about the investors themselves. Who are they? What is the organization behind? What is the non-financial support that they can bring me um, be beyond money? Uh, what are their real expectations into a return of investment or uh, let's say payback, payback period or exit strategy? Um, and, and that's something we do with Solifin. We try to, to bring as much information as we can uh, to help the entrepreneurs actually realizing that once you have a good project, you should be the one doing the, cho the shopping, you know, and you should be picky. You should really take the time and, and, and know what you want and look for this uh, uh, right investor or right funding uh, mix. Um, that you need. So that, that's really something that we, we are doing and we are pushing for our members, which are the, the financial actors, to share as much information and not to be um, scared of sharing this information. Uh, so there, there is a lot of uh, mentality change that, that I see. But what, what I want to, to add on this uh, top of that is that um, for me, and it's not my hat from Solifin, I would say it's more my personal hat. I think everything starts uh, personally. So what I see is that the best way to, to help entrepreneurs today is um, to help them realize that they are the center of their company. And, and it's, it's mainly the case for the first years. I mean, uh, until the team is reached like 10 people, um, the, the strength and the weaknesses of a of business will be very much related to the strength and weaknesses of the entrepreneur himself. And that's that, and, and it's the same thing for money, uh, our personal relation with money. No one is at peace with money. Either some are just, um, uh, let's say, making it uh, the, 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 the main objective of, the, of their life and others are fighting against it because they are, let's say, um, a bit more, um, um, I don't know, uh, against the world of capitalism, against the world of money. And, and it makes often their projects being a mirror of this relationship as well. Um, and so what I would think uh, the, be the best way to, to help entrepreneurs there for the social mobility is to, to um, convey more training on, on personal development. Who am I as an entrepreneur? What is my relationship to money? And it should start there, actually, because um, it, this will be uh, very helpful for, um, yeah, for the entire business venture afterwards, I would say. And yeah, the last thing that I wanted to say is that um, we are definitely working on having our members, um, let's say, joining and um, improving their practices with entrepreneurs. So we are um, focusing a lot now on impact. So 
most of the entrepreneurs that we help are actually not willing to exit, let's say, within four or five years. They're there really because it's, it, they are super motivated and it's mainly the case with societal impact. I mean, you can see they have it in their blood and that's why they are um, uh, uh, launching this adventure, I would say. So, um, but still in the practices of the investor side, there's still lots of things we can prove. Uh, I've heard the diversity within the investment team. This is something that definitely, uh, I wouldn't say our network is uh, um, the most diverse when we look at uh, the investment team, uh, definitely. But um, but but also, yeah, just, um, no, but I'm, I'm gonna stop here because I, I still have lots of things to say, but um, um, yeah. So this is how we see a societal, uh, social mobility within entrepreneurship. And it starts with, uh, I would say, the, the personal um, uh, development uh, at first. That is a beautiful conclusion, Savan. Um, thank you so much for joining the panel today. Mobinti, Temi, Priya, Marie, Savan, thank you. <laughs>